What's up y'all? Welcome back to The Build. Over the next couple days, I'm gonna be focused on the underbody of this Datsun 280Z. It's probably not gonna be fun, but we're gonna have a nice new Raptor liner undercoating when it's all said and done. Most of the undercoating on this car actually doesn't look that bad, but there are a lot of spots where the undercoating is just flaking off. Doing an undercoating really depends on what your goals are. Your goals can be to strip everything down to bare metal, go with an epoxy primer, and then undercoat, or you can just kind of touch up spots that need attention. My goal is to be somewhere in the middle. I'm definitely not going for a show car look here. I just want to make sure I have a nice layer of undercoat on the bottom of the car. There are some more expensive options out there if you have the means to get the old undercoat off. You can do dry ice blasting or just general media blasting. You could do a chemical dip, but these options are a little more expensive. So I'm just going to go with the wire wheel at home. It's going to be a painful long experience. But again, I'm not going for perfection, just trying to scuff up the surface and break any loose undercoating off. The first step is to jack the car up as high as possible, which for me, I've already done and remove all the suspension and components that are going to get in the way. So let's get that wire wheel out and get to work. Just to reiterate, this is a big project. I think it took me around seven days of work with filming included. This could be made much shorter if you skimp on the prep, don't need the seam sealer, or you don't need to apply a primer. If you take things down to bare metal by hand without a media blaster, then this could take you a lot longer. There's multiple ways and levels to do an undercoat, but to give you an idea, here's the order I did and how much time I allocated for each of them. And again, I'm just using the wire wheel to break off any loose undercoating and smooth out some of this old bumpy undercoating. I mostly use the knotted wire cup and crimped wire brushes on the grinder. The wire brush gets in those tight spots really well, but it will send little metal arrows flying all over. For a couple of areas, I did use a strip disc, which eats through the undercoating really quickly, and it's ideal for getting down to bare metal, if that's your goal. But it did still leave a little undercoating smeared on the surface. Any rust I saw, I spent more time there and took it down to bare metal, and later I'll hit it with a rust reformer. And it's worth keeping track of any areas that do get taken down to bare metal, because those will have to get painted with an epoxy primer or a self-etching primer. This part took a good long while. Why didn't I pay for dry ice blasting again? This is all the undercoat I took off. Not to mention probably twice of this in my eyes. As you can see, there's a ton of nooks and crannies down here. So I did what I could and the rest will just try to get really clean. So it's far from perfect, you don't need to tell me, but I think once we get everything cleaned up and spray the new liner on, it's gonna look great and it should adhere really well to you. All right, so my next step is to uh, put this rust cutter on any spots that do have some surface rust or that seem to have a little bit deeper rust that I can't really get to. So once you apply this, the directions say on the back to let it dry, which can take up to four days apparently. And I believe this one has actually some of the higher potency in terms of the acid that converts that rust into something that's paintable. This rust reformer is strong. It'll stain clothes, it'll stain your concrete floors, pretty much anything it touches. It doesn't smell great either. For bad spots, I had to let it soak in and iterate a few times. It does leave a residue behind, which will eventually dry into a hard pink substance. I recommend cleaning up as much rust reformer as you can before it dries because the residue doesn't seem the strongest for painting on top of. And why am I showing you my interior floor pans in a video about undercoating? Because I'll be using an epoxy primer later and while I have it activated, I'm going to coat this floor pan just to protect it from surface rust. And these same steps can be applied to any part of the underbody. Some may argue that using pour 15 over these rust spots is a better approach. But from what I've read and seen, this approach should give the best adhesion. So after letting that rust cutter dry, it leaves behind some residue and it hardens. And it seems like the best way to get that up is using a wire wheel. The underbody was still filthy from the wire wheel and I wanted to figure out the best way to clean it without leaving the metal wet and likely to rust, especially since this is a multi-day project. I did a small test and found out that the cleaners and metal prep solutions all left a residue behind that I didn't want to try to paint on top of. So I devised an overly complicated way of cleaning. So what I'm going to do is clean everything first with a ZEP and using a nylon brush and a microfiber to get everything as clean as possible. Then I'm going to rinse it with distilled water 
tap water has a bunch of minerals in it that can rust metal more quickly the air compressor to clean off as much water as possible and then a quick little rinse with some acetone because that evaporates really quickly and can display some of that water to prevent rust i may have went a little overboard but prep is so important i wanted it to be as clean as possible and not cause any rust to form and this wasn't even the final prep step before applying the undercoat. Use your own discretion for how far you want to go in prep. After having worked with it, the Raptor liner is very sticky, so maybe all these steps weren't fully necessary, but better safe than sorry. Now what I'm doing with those bare metal areas, like here and over here, I'm hitting it with an 80 grit sandpaper so that way the primer has something to adhere to. I'm gonna use a 2K epoxy primer in a can and just kind of touch up any of those bare metal areas. But first I need to make sure it has some abrasion to it. Probably the most difficult thing to get the primer to adhere to is just bare sheet metal. So I wanna make sure I sand this down really well with that 80 grit get this as clean as possible. And then that 2K epoxy primer should adhere really well. With everything clean and all the bare metal sanded down, now for the final prep, I'm gonna wipe it down with some acetone. Now there's two options for this project. There's an acid edge primer, which is a little cheaper, and I have a 2K epoxy primer. And this should be a little stronger than using just a 1K acid edge primer. And then if I have any touch up spots afterwards, I could come back with the acid edge primer and touch those up as well. Because once this can is popped and mixed into its 2K parts, it will only be good for a couple days. And this works by a button on the bottom. Some of you may have seen this. And this stuff is pretty nasty, so make sure you have a respirator with the proper cartridges. On the large bare metal areas, I apply at least two coats of epoxy primer. After the primer dries, now I need to apply a seam sealer wherever I remove the OEM sealer and on top of my welds. Per the 3M instructions, I use a Scotch-Brite pad to knock down and abrade the epoxy primer. Then to clean it, I lightly use a rag with some acetone. Heavy pressure seemed to dissolve the epoxy primer because I'm guessing it wasn't fully set yet. So this is what I'm going to use is a 3M seam sealer and to smooth it I'll be using a little bit of acetone. I'll try to brush it see how that works but the acetone should help me move it around and keep it flexible. I used some Gatorade cap to hold some acetone so I could dip the brush into it and then clean it out from time to time. For the long seams, I do sections at a time to stop it from drying. Just a little bit of acetone on the brush keeps the seam sealer from sticking or smearing. Too much acetone and it'll turn into a sludgy mess. I should have widened my nozzle a little bit, but if you have a thin nozzle, then you can tap the sealer on both sides of the weld to help spread it out. Later on, I found the best method was applying a thick bead and then using a brush in one smooth, continuous motion versus this dabbing method that I did earlier. It gave it a much more OEM look. You can of course use painter's tape on both sides of the bead, but make sure to pull it up quickly while it's still wet. But I personally wasn't too worried about the aesthetics since it's gonna be Raptor lined and on the bottom of the car. And don't judge too much, but on these floor pans, I did apply some seam sealer across a couple areas where I couldn't repair the rust. If it rusts out, I'll fix it then. But for now, my thinking was that the metal was so porous, applying a thin coat of seam sealer over the top of those areas should help the moisture from sitting on the metal. So as I went along, I got a little bit better at applying the seam sealer to just look a little bit better. So the best luck I had was laying a pretty good sized bead along the top of the weld, maybe going a little bit side to side to spread it out a little bit. And then using a clean paintbrush, using acetone in between to clean it. And then just doing one smooth straight motion along the entire bead. As soon as you let off 
and then go back on it, it's gonna leave a bunch of strings and mess up the, the looks. And then if you need to touch up some areas, dipping this in acetone, drying it off just a little bit, and then kind of cleaning up the area you need to, worked pretty well. The epoxy primer I applied probably didn't stick super well to every single surface I sprayed it on. So to clean everything up and abrade the surface, I'm gonna take a scotch Bright pad to everything I'm gonna paint. I've done my best to prep it for the undercoat. This stuff is pretty heavy, so it shouldn't spray really far. And I am gonna eventually repaint the car, so I'm not too worried about it getting it on the paint. But I mainly wanna protect the garage floor. And of course, I taped up all the threads that I don't wanna get the undercoating on. And I taped up these bushing surfaces as well. I could have done a better job covering the garage floor and the car, but I worked with what I had. I draped some plastic over the sides of the car and taped it down. I also put some weights at the end of the plastic to hold it down along the side of the car. And the last thing to do before applying the Raptor liner is yet another wipe down of the acetone. And then I'm gonna do some last minute touch ups with this acid etch primer on any bare metal that I might've missed. Let it dry for 30 minutes to an hour, and then it'll be painting time. Alright, everything is as clean as I can get it, and we are ready. Just gotta turn on the compressor, shake up the bottle with the hardener in it, and then get to spraying. Now the fun begins. My compressor is on the smaller side, so I used the bursting spray method, and I ran my compressor on the lower end of the recommended range. It was around 40 PSI. And of course, that's 40 PSI while the trigger is being depressed, not the static pressure. It sprayed really well though. In between changing out bottles, I would clean the gun with some of the acetone because the liner would start to gum up a little bit. I personally went for a two coat approach, the first one being pretty light, and then the second one being a little heavier. And the answer is no. This is not easy to apply on your back with a car that isn't on a lift. The angles are awkward. The gun has an air vent where the paint can leak out of. But worst of all is the plastic I laid down essentially turned into one of those giant sticky mouse traps. After the Raptor liner touched the plastic, it all became really sticky. So I had to crawl around on my back on the plastic. I just embraced it, got Raptor liner all over myself and my clothes as expected, but got it done. things are still wet, check for overspray and wipe it down with acetone. Also take off any masking tape or anything else as soon as possible while it's still wet. probably tell that my coating is a little thin in a couple of areas. Unfortunately, my bottle of hardener actually leaked, so I could only use half of the last bottle. Even so, a fifth bottle probably would have been nice to do some more touch up in a couple of the thinner spots. But the wheel well areas I focused on a lot, so I got a good amount of coverage there. So that is it guys, we got the Raptor liner on the car and I love it. It's really solid and this stuff is not coming off. If you look here, like there's a part I didn't even really prep the metal, and like even if I try to peel it up aggressively, nothing. This stuff is like super glue when you spray it down. It sticks really well to everything, which is great for the coating, but terrible to apply. You can do it without a car lift like I did, but it was not that fun. There was all that plastic I had protecting the concrete, and guess what? It stuck to me like crazy. 
Even the rubber hose going to the paint gun was sticking to my back. I definitely wear one of those plastic painting suits you can buy just because getting this Raptor liner on my arms meant it was there for a few days. I don't know how else to do it other than flop around on the plastic mat, but maybe you guys have some ideas. Oh, and this stuff is still gassing off. It's like three or four days later and I can still smell it in the garage. But overall, I'm really pleased with the way it looks. I think it's gonna stick on the car for a really long time and provide some great protection for the underbody. And also, if I had to do it again, I would have laid out a little more plastic on the concrete. There's a couple areas that were maybe two or three feet away from the car where the Raptor liner did get on the concrete. But I'll probably just use a wire wheel to try to get it off. But that's it for this video. Make sure to stay tuned for the next one where we put the suspension on the Datsun and hopefully get it back on the ground.